So a little birdie told me that you're leaving Oak Farm. What a shame. But you taught me in year six all those years ago. And yeah, I just wanted to say thank you very much for teaching me, getting me onto the next step, making me try and become one more step to becoming an adult. Sasham was just a kind soul. He was thoughtful, he was caring, and he wanted the best for everyone. Hi guys, what is up? It's um, Sean Daniel here. Family means the world to us. Tashan was the son that I believe every parent will want to have. Tashan celebrated his 20th birthday with both us as friends and his family as well. He loved to dance and he was a very, very kind of positive person. I had a phone call from Deshaun's friend's dad. Didn't say much, he just said something happened. The reports were of a fight, of a stabbing, and you know, a male being seriously injured. When we got there, there was loads of police cars, ambulances, there was everyone crowding around, basically. I just couldn't understand what was going on. And I didn't even notice the wounds or anything. I was just staring at Deshaun's face stroking him, wondering why he wasn't responding. Two young men together at a train station, and at least one of them is looking for trouble. And two young men on the other side of the platform were the unfortunate victims. They were chosen completely at random. These murderers are cowardly in their actions. They felt it appropriate to carry a weapon of that nature on a busy train station. And the lack of remorse shown throughout is clear for all to see. I know for a fact those particular men don't know my son or his friend, two total strangers. Just didn't like the look of them and took my son's life. He just turned 20. It was a Tuesday, so it was a typical morning. Tashan was still in bed. Um, I was getting ready for school. Usually, I always say goodbye to him in the mornings. He would come downstairs while I'd be eating my breakfast. That day, he was very tired because he had training the day before, so he stayed and had a lie-in. Then I left for school without saying a proper goodbye. Tashan had taken his granddad to a daycare centre, dropped him there, and then popped in to see his mum at work, had lunch with her, picked his granddad back up again, dropped him home. I was home, we spoke, and he was really excited about going to the game. From a very young age, he kind of got embedded within to the Arsenal culture, uh, the Gooners. He would treat himself. He bought an Arsenal ticket to watch the game on that 24th. He got changed, put his Arsenal top on, and his friend came to meet him at home. I was doing something on the computer that I needed his help because Tashan was my technical guy. I was absolutely useless. But because he was in a rush, he couldn't do it. And he just ruffled my head, gave me a kiss like he always did. And he said, Dad, I'll sort it out tomorrow. And off they went. They walked down to, to the train station. I was originally meant to go with him to the Arsenal game, but I couldn't get the time off work. So I found myself coming back on the train when I noticed that Hillingdon was out of service. At the time, I didn't know why. I returned home. I did message him to ask him how um, he was getting to the football game, but I didn't have a reply at this point. The 
British Transport Police is responsible for all crimes that take place on the railway, station and railway infrastructure. From the lowest investigation, which probably be a fair evasion, up into the most serious investigations, such as murders. British Transport Police were informed through 999 calls made by witnesses and members of the public at Hillingdon. The reports were of a, a fight, of a stabbing, and a male being seriously injured. Very clearly, it was a serious incident that we were going to have to deal with. I'd finished school that day, and when I got home, I was sat downstairs with my dad. Then my dad had got a phone call from uh, Tashan's friend's dad. The only thing that we'd been told was to go to the station. Me and Oceana jumped in the car to drive down to the station. I rang Celia. Got a feeling that something bad had happened driving from work to the station. My mum mentioned that there had been a stabbing at Hillingdon Station, but at the point, nothing was revealed to the public of who it was. As I was driving down there, the phone call was someone had been stabbed, and I just refused to believe it. Peter Shine, there was no way. And there's no way. Shine's never been in trouble. He would walk away from a fight. I tried to call him about five times, and I also messaged him asking him if he was OK. I tried to call my friend, who was also with him. At that time as well, it was 3.30, 3.40 in the afternoon at Hillington Station. It just didn't add up. I told Oceana to stay in the car, and I ran to the station. The policeman said, no, you can't go down there. And I said to them that I think it's my son. When I arrived at the station, there was loads, loads, loads of police, ambulance, cars, everything. By that time, Shandy was already with him, holding him. And Oceana was just at the top of the station looking down. So they took me down to him because I begged, please, I need to go. I need to go down. I think there was difficulties in some respects of them entering the scene because it was a crime scene. We discovered that a male had been injured, which turned out to be Tashan. Along with that, there was a friend who was present with Tashan at the time. There are multiple units arriving at different times. There was a very quick police response along with the ambulance service. The air ambulance attended as well. And it was very quickly established that Tashan's life was pronounced extinct. A member of the air ambulance paramedic said to me that they'd been working on Tashan for 20 minutes. They had tried everything that they could do. Um, he'd lost a lot of blood. And unfortunately, they're going to stop working on him. And then when Celia rushed over to Tashan, and then I had to tell, tell Celia. Tashan's parents would have witnessed a horrific scene, really. There was an awful lot of blood, obviously distressed people still around, medical staff. Um, but obviously, the most impactive thing they saw was, was Tashan, and probably that sense of helplessness. I still couldn't get my head around it. I just thought he had fallen. I was in shock. I just couldn't understand what was going on. I didn't even notice the wounds or anything. I was just staring at Tashan's face, stroking him, wondering why he wasn't responding. Shandy was still holding him. And I asked, could I hold his hand, please? And they said just for a minute, because he had just been pronounced. I collapsed on the floor. And one of the officers kind of hold me back, hold me up. Sean received a single stab wound that punctured his chest, punctured his heart, and into the lung. 
which was the fatal and only injury that Tashan received. I just remember my dad screaming, saying that he didn't make it. The emotions that I was feeling was just numbness, really. I couldn't comprehend it. I couldn't take it in. As soon as Tashan was confirmed to be dead, then that became a murder investigation. There are certain kind of fast time actions which are generated, which is securing the scene and making sure that nothing's contaminated, making sure any evidence that we can obtain is obtained in a forensic manner. And then looking wider afield about how we can capture images, suspect movements, and what's actually taken place. And there's also the harvesting of intelligence in relation to what witnesses say they saw, which way those suspects went, was anything discarded. So quite quickly, your scene is very, very large. You think that violent assaults take place in dark corners, not in front of everybody on a busy train platform. This is not what you expect to happen in front of your eyes in the midst of a crowd. I think that any conceptions you had about what is a safe place and what is not a safe place are suddenly blown out of the water. At the station itself, we found no real evidence apart from the evidence which was unfortunately to Sean. We had multiple witnesses at the scene who had actually seen the incident, albeit fleetingly, as the train had pulled into the station. Most of our key witnesses were on the train, so some of their visions was obscured and the train was moving at the time. But it became quite apparent there had been an altercation on the platform. On the CCTV, it showed the white male quite quickly gets involved in a heated discussion, argument with two males on the opposite platform. As he's going up the stairs, he meets the black male and they both then go down onto that opposite platform where Tashan was with his friend. And almost instantaneously, a physical assault starts taking place. In the initial stages of the investigation, I have to base my hypotheses on what I think has taken place, the reasons for it. Initially, I thought that it would be gang-related or that there was knowledge of issues between the two parties, and then maybe it being football-related, because Tashan was wearing an Arsenal football shirt. We need to identify those suspects are, so I put parameters in place in relation to CCTV trolls and obviously house-to-house -house inquiries, the witness appeal that we launched very, very quickly, the multiple social media lines that we're getting in. All of these are avenues we have to explore and have to develop to try and identify who those suspects are, a white male and a black male in London. Finally, my friend rang me back, very shaken up. He was like, I'm so, so sorry, Leon. Um, I couldn't do anything. Um, Tashan's gone, and my heart just shattered. They ushered us into the staff ticket office room at Hindman Station. None of us knew what to do, really. It was just, you know, there were lots of tears, hugs and thing, but we were all in a state of shock. We were just still couldn't understand, couldn't believe it. Tashan would have been the last person that should have happened to. It just wouldn't sink in, just couldn't process it, really. Tashan did not have any grudges with anyone. No one had anything against Tashan. So for someone to do this, it had to be a stranger. Tashan was the most amazing son. He had manners. He looked after all his cousins, his friends. Just know, like, if you don't get the results you want, just know everything happens for a reason at the end of the day. Like, everything will work out in its end. Like, if things go back, it's how you come back from that, innit? Minor setbacks, major comebacks, G. 
come on. And especially his baby sister. Me and Tashan had a bond that I can't really describe. We got on like best friends. There would obviously be times where we didn't get along, but most of the time that we spent was always laughing. Me and Tashan grew up together. We played for various different football teams. I believe we started at the age of five. Tashan had a real passion for athletics. It was 200 meters, 400 meters, and long jump. His passion really came when he excelled at 200 meters. He was absolutely demolishing his time and also breaking records within the borough and middle sex. I had a group of young athletes and Tashan was one of them. I soon noticed that Tashan had um, an ability that not many people have. He was very explosive, very elastic type of athlete, which is necessary for sprinting. This kid had the ability to go very far in the sport and he wanted to go as far as the Olympic Games and that was definitely something that we was heading towards. This incident occurred on September 24th, 2019 at the tube station during peak commuter time. There were plenty of witnesses, lots of people going in and out of the station, CCTV cameras. This was not something that was going to be hidden for long and certainly the people that did it knew that they were in plain sight of lots of onlookers and chose to do it anyway. When we started researching to Sean and his friend, these were really good kids. There was nothing in relation to them and the police. It became very apparent very, very quickly that to Sean didn't know the suspect. And so it was really just a stranger attack. It seemed to be completely and utterly unprovoked. Witnesses reported, along with the CCTV, of the location that showed both suspects running out of the station, stopping briefly, and appearing to smile only moments after taking Tashan's life. This is obviously going to cause concern for the officers who are in charge of this investigation. Are they going to do something similar soon? Because they seem to have enjoyed this experience. And so they're going to want to find them as soon as possible. We were able to establish very, very quickly that they exited the station. And following that, witnesses had started reporting that they'd seen two males acting suspiciously, approximately about 500 metres away, to a road in Oriel Drive. That was probably an hour and a half after the incident. And there we found clothing that had been discarded. Their intention was to disguise themselves, and they've done that by removing their clothing, stealing women's pajamas from a washing line, and a towel for the purpose of making sure that they weren't seen in the clothing they had been wearing. Albeit the disguises they chose probably made members of the public more aware of their movements and their behavior. Whilst that crime scene was maintained, we brought in a dog, and that police dog identified the location of the murder weapon, which had been hidden under some rocks, separate and away from the clothing. This wasn't a kitchen knife taken from a block at a home. This was an aviator knife produced in Germany. It was a horrific knife. One that if you were to stab somebody with that knife, there's really only one consequence which is gonna happen from that. And that, unfortunately, is the death of another human being. I got a call from my dad saying he's coming straight home and that we were going to go around to Sean's house to speak to the family. And I remember getting outside the door and the police were still there. They asked me, why are you going in? How do you know the family? 
and I explained to them how I knew them. And then one of them gave me a hug and I asked them whether it, it, he was, he passed away um, and they said, yeah. What made it real for me was when I walked through the door and I saw his parents in pieces and that's when I broke down. It just felt weird, really, that my brother was on the news as a victim of knife crime, something that I never, ever in my life would have thought happened. So the police were very supportive. They gave us the information that they could have at the time, as much as the information that they knew. They didn't really know much. No one knew much. I tried to distract myself by going to school, and obviously I know things were never going to go back to normal, but I just wanted it to. I just, I hated everything that was going on. Days after it happened with Tishan, Shandy Oshi and myself were not sleeping at all. We were actually were sleeping in Tishan's bedroom. You know, thinking maybe he's going to come home. But we know he wasn't coming back. Three of us were completely emptied, had no more tears left. All three of us were completely flat. The DCI said to us, he know, looking at some of the footage at that particular time, it was unprovoked. And he said to us, we will find, we will get them. He made it clear that it was not gang-related, drugs-related. It was an innocent young man standing, waiting for a train. I know my son and his friend are not fighters. They're just normal two lads, just minding their own business. There's often the misconception that a victim must have done something to provoke an attack, particularly when that victim is a black young man. Now, Tashan was not involved in any gang-related activity. He was not involved in any law-breaking activity. He was in no way connected to the man who chose to kill him. So he's completely innocent in all of this. So having visited the family, I was immediately presented with a loving family, one that was all coming together, all wanting to know the process, how we were going to capture these people that had done this to their son and loved one. And that puts extra pressure on me, but at the same time really pushes me forward and drives me to make sure that we get the best possible result we can get for the family. So when we found that clothing and the knife, it was forensically recovered by trained officers, and that was sent to the laboratory for analysis. And three days later, that result came back on a specific baseball cap, which gave us the DNA of the suspect, the white male, who was Alex Lanning. This is a breakthrough moment in the investigation because there's DNA of somebody else, and that somebody else is Alex Lanning. Alex Lanning was known to the police. Lanning had been sentenced in relation to a Section 20 wounding where a knife had been used in Brighton during a drug deal. Not only has Lanning served time for stabbing somebody, not once, but 11 times, he's actually still on license for that offence. He was sentenced to four years and served half of that. Probably a very lenient sentence to take account of his young age. But here he is, he's on license. He should be keeping his nose clean, not involving himself in totally unnecessary and mindless violence. It's my opinion that Alex Lanning would have known that he would have either seriously injured or killed Deshaun, just by the nature of the weapon that he used, the force he used, and the fact that he would have been covered in blood. 
the fact that this man had this specific type of knife and had no reason to use it shows that he was co-opting it for a criminal purpose. And then to use it against this poor boy who had done nothing to him, it was almost like he was getting a thrill out of it, perhaps because he had done it in the past and enjoyed it so much, or because he wanted more street credibility by using this knife and really didn't care about the consequences. This was a very, very quick confrontation started by Alex Lanning on the opposite platform and then carried through to the attack on Tashan and his friend. So we now have Alex Lanning. My main priority is him and finding out everything I possibly can about his friends, associates, where he lives, his family. Try to put things in place to identify him, catch him in relation to this murder. The killer and his accomplice go on the run. It tells you a little bit about them. These are not a pair of individuals who are going to hand themselves in. They're not going to acknowledge what they've done and what they have taken from Tashan's family. So they're clearly not really thinking about this in a way that serves anybody other than themselves. we established that Alex Lanning's iPhone had turned back on, which gave us hope of identifying where his location would be. But it quickly transpired that Alex Lanning had sold his iPhone with the assistance of, of two friends in a local second-hand shop in Uxbridge and had received a, a significant amount of money. The problem then for us carrying out a manhunt was they now have funds. So, it makes it harder because they can go further and actually stay off the police radar for longer, which is a frustration. We're doing all the background work in relation to Alex Lanning, what his life was about, his family, his friends, his associates, people that he'd been in prison with. We're doing all of that research, but I still have another suspect outstanding. Four hours after the name of Alex Lanning came through, we received intelligence that linked a Jojo. That's all we had, a nickname. On Sunday the 29th, in the early hours, we found that a nickname of Jojo was running a drugs line in the southwest. Further research on Jojo gave us a custody image, and he matched the CCTV from Hillingdon and the Black Mail. Jonathan Camille. Jonathan Camille only had a previous caution in relation to drugs, but there was intelligence linking Jonathan Camille to drug supply, not just in that area of Hillingdon, but also wider field. Jonathan Camille was somebody who was known to the police because he'd been involved in county lines drug dealing. So that's trafficking drugs from one area of the UK to another. Now, a lot of young boys are often recruited into county lines, so they are exploited. And it's possible that he had been exploited as a youth, but as an adult, he had continued drug dealing. And at that point, he is fully responsible for his actions. We had a manhunt. We were trying to find Alex Lanning and Jonathan Camille, who were doing their best to evade us in London and the home counties. So the, the needle in the haystack springs to mind. What I found very, very difficult was having to speak to the family regularly and just to keep them on board that we were doing everything we could and that we knew who they were. It was just we just had to find them. I was more scared for my daughter, Oceana, because how close it happened to home, how close we lived from the station, I was more proud to protect her while they were still on the run. So I started to think, how am I going to actually capture Alex Lanning and Jonathan Camille? We found Jonathan Camille through his family, his associates, and we started monitoring his movements. But my main focus was Alex Lanning. He was the one that had used that weapon, and I needed Alex Lanning in custody. Well, I've got a choice to make. I'm going to arrest Jonathan Camille, and then potentially Alex Lanning goes further and further away, more under the radar. But I felt that we were getting closer and closer to Alex Lanning with that link to Jonathan Camille. 
and I knew that I had to get Alex Lanning in custody. The police at this point would be looking at their mobile phones, tracing where calls are coming from. They'd be looking at whether there's a digital print of them, so are they spending money anywhere on their bank cards? Put some triggers in place, and that involved some friends who'd been involved in assisting Alex Lanning selling his mobile phone, and also looking at a cellmate that Alex Lanning had spent five months in prison with. So we were looking at those associates. We started arresting individuals or applying some form of police pressure in relation to making Camille and Lanning come out to make them meet with each other. My hypothesis is Jonathan Camille was going to lead us to Alex Lanning. We actually lost the surveillance on Camille. I was under intense pressure, but I've got a very, very supportive team. And I have an incredibly supportive family into Sean's family. And they were kept up to date as best I could. I don't think my heart actually worked on those 10 days. It was really, really nerve wracking because I didn't want my son, Tashan, killers to be on the run. We have phone activation and we managed to obtain surveillance again on Jonathan Camille in central London, where he met with Alex Lanning. We then continued that surveillance through central London along Oxford Street. They were located in court in the Cheapside area of London. On October the 4th, 2019, Lanning and Camille were arrested. So this was after 10 days on the run. great sense of relief when we were able to inform the family that we'd kept good on our promise. We're going to arrest the individuals involved in killing Tashan. They'd supported me through those 10 days of that investigation and when I made that promise, and they'd kept faith. I must say the British Transport Police was really, really good with us. Every little bit leading up to the arrest, they will keep us in touch. Let us, us know how close, what they're planning to do, what the situation is, and exactly what they said to us, that they wanted to catch both of them together, not just one and the other. They did exactly what they did and caught the both of them together. Knowing that they caught them, some form of justice could be served. In order to put my son to rest properly. Alex Lanning was interviewed at length around the murder. He chose to answer all comments, no comment, um, and gave no indication or remorse during those interviews. Jonathan Camille was also interviewed during custody where he prepared a statement and that statement basically denied his involvement in the murder. And that was really all that he said. The memorial that we had for Tasham was as good as it could be. It was emotional. However, it was a good way to celebrate Tashan's life. I know Tashan is looking down on us right now, and I truly believe he knows how much he was loved. From family to friends, Tashan was honourable. He cared for everyone, and he always done his best to make everyone around him proud. He and Lyndon literally came into a standstill. The gospel singing, um, the live band, the amount of people. People told me it was about a thousand people there on that day. Our saying was fresh, fly and funky, because that's the person that Tishan was. We all wore trainers, because Tishan loved his trainers. Uh, we listened to his favourite music. Everyone kind of got together to celebrate the amazing person Tashan was. So many people said they've never been to, to something like that in their lifetime. It was just made us really proud um, that Tashan, that we were able to give Tashan that, that send off. 
we will all never forget you. Our best friend, our brother, our family. May you rest in eternal peace. I love you, brother. I think he was with us in spirit, and I think he would have been happy with the turnout and also all the loved ones that were there to celebrate his life. It made me proud to call to Sean, my brother. I try my best to make you proud because you made me and so many other people in this room proud. Rest in the everlasting peace, my best friend. I love you. When we received back the DNA analysis from that murder weapon, it just confirmed what we already knew, that supporting evidence that Alex Lanning's DNA was on that murder weapon, unfortunately, along with the DNA of Tashan Daniels. The court process is always a very daunting one probably made even more so by it being at the most famous court in the land, the Old Bailey. I get nervous at the Old Bailey. I can only imagine how nervous and traumatic it was for the family. We had to gear ourselves up for the trial. But I've never been to court. We'd never experienced anything like this. So we were psyching ourselves up for it. I particularly were very, very scared because when we first set eyes on the two lads, they had no remorse whatsoever. No remorse. And that was painful. Painful. In court, we were able to find out exactly what had happened. We were able to also watch it on the CCTV as well, and how Tashan did spend the last moments of his life, and that my friend was also pleading to Tashan to, to, to hang on and to do the best he could to stay alive. And it just goes to show the damage that, one, that knife did, and two, the power that uh, the attacker did use to harm Tashan. With Camille, when it was the first day of the trial, he'd looked back at us quite a lot of times, and I just remember questioning, like, how do you have the audacity to look at us in the eye? Lannan, he did not look at us at all. He kind of kept himself to himself. He didn't turn back. He looked straight at the judge. Alex Lanning, he admitted the manslaughter, but claimed that it was an accident, that Tashan had fallen on the knife. And then those defences seemed to change and morph slightly during the trial, but he always denied the murder. When I heard the defence's story, I was just shocked, really. I think that's the best way to describe it. I couldn't believe the stuff that they were saying. The defence team tried to make it out that Deshaun's friend started the altercation by saying, what are you looking at? And Deshaun had fired a punch to one of the guys. But he was actually trying to block himself when he watched the footage. Deshaun was literally trying to protect himself. Within a split second, he did that to my child defense team saying it was an accident. It was not an accident. It was actually, he went out there to do something to somebody. You do not walk the street with the type of knife that he walked with. I felt a hatred, really. And it's not in our nature to be like that. But just felt an immense hatred that two people could do something like that to someone else go on the run for 10 days. And some of the stuff that we heard in court was heartbreaking. Alex Lanning received a life sentence in relation to murder. He will not be eligible for parole for 25 years. 
and Jonathan Camille was convicted of manslaughter and was sentenced to six years and six months for his part in the offence. And I think that is appropriate. The fact that Jonathan Camille wasn't responsible for the blade being forced into Tashan's chest, nevertheless, his specific involvement during that violence was a catalyst to all of the events. And he has to accept his responsibility for the death of Tashan almost as much as Alex Lanning. The nature of these offenses was entirely impulsive and completely reckless. Truly, it could have happened to anybody on that platform that day. And unfortunately, it just so happened to happen to Tishan. This was like a five minute event. Alex landing on one platform starting a confrontation and argument for no reason. And he could have just walked away, and he didn't. And now the family are left with that huge hole, and they can't feel that. As parents, we had to watch in disbelief as the paramedics worked on our son's lifeless body on that platform at Hillenden a platform which we will never be able to use again. It's frightening to think that all of this can come from a glance. You look at the wrong person in a certain kind of way that they interpret as a funny look or a dirty look. This is across a train platform Chances are that he wasn't even looking at them in the first place. And if he were, so what? This is a frightening part about this. The fact that violence can spring from such a tiny, tiny trigger. Still upset for my brother. He didn't get to have those dreams that he wanted. And it's just, it's indescribable to say how angry I feel about how he was killed because someone didn't like the way that he looked at him. Half of my heart is broken and it's never gonna be mended ever again. It would have been beautiful to see how his life would have planned out. It would have been beautiful to see that because he's a good human being. He's a loving human being. I miss Tashan every single day. And there's not a day that goes by where I don't think about him. There's not a day that goes by that I don't think about what he'd be doing right now with his athletics, with him smashing the goals. We used to watch Deshaun train here. We used to watch him compete here. So it's full of lots of good, good, good family memories, actually. There's a massive, huge hole in our hearts and in our lives. I think everyone's got their own memories of Deshaun. It's definitely fond, happy memories of him. I don't really recall any bad words or bad memories of, that anyone has to say of Deshaun. And, for me, as his dad, as his, I'm really pleased to hear that. Um, I know that we raised a, a fine young man, and to hear the, the amazing words that I said about him fills my heart with joy. As you can see, not much has really changed apart from this little bum fluff on my face. But thank you very much for teaching me in year six, and uh, I wish you all the best in your next chapter of your life.